Hello, welcome to Atomic Physics, our next topic, um, and the first video in this topic, which we're going to look at line spectra, absorption and emission. Now, in Atomic Physics, we're going to pretty much look at two separate areas, but they're all going to be bundled together, and they are sort of interrelated to each other. We're going to learn about what we mean by energy levels in atoms, and then we're going to tie in nuclear energy and how it's uh, where it comes from and how we use it as well. But first of all, let's do the energy levels and we're going to do emission and absorption spectrum. And before we do that, let's just recap again the electromagnetic spectrum. We've mentioned that before and we've used it uh, when we were doing waves and light. Um, pretty much uh, this is what we're talking about. It uh, expresses the uh, entire spectrum in terms of wavelength or frequency. And we've got the visible light there. And so we're going to, in this section, we're going to be looking at a lot of this. Um, and our focus will be pretty much on emission and absorption spectrum in the visible spectrum. Um, but remember that uh, We've got all the rest of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum to look at and people are actually interested in that as well in terms of emission and absorption spectrum. Now, what do we mean by spectra? Well, let's go back and do a little bit of history about uh, some of the scientists involved in it. Niels Bohr was a very famous uh, uh, physicist he died in 1962, which isn't too long ago. He's uh, got recognition for the work on his the structure of atoms, and he got a Nobel Prize for that in 1922. And when we did physical science and we looked uh, at uh, the history of our understanding of the atom, Niels Bohr's work is uh, some of the most recent work and um, puts us in the modern context. That's what he looked like. Uh, there he is with a famous person, uh, Einstein, and they have, during the uh, 1910s to 20s, um, physicists were always seemed to be having discussions and immense conversations about really significant things that nowadays in terms of physics we take for granted, um, but then it was revolutionary at the, around that time. So. Bohr proposed a theory for the atom and basically it was that you had an overall positive nucleus which was surrounded by uh, fast moving negatively charged electrons. Now this was an evolution from what was called the pudding model or the Rutherford model um, and there were a couple of other models and it was a development and it's what we pretty much teach you nowadays. Um, in physical science um, and in physics we're going to extend it a little bit more um, so we do like to picture a nucleus with electrons whizzing around it um, but now we're going to dis start describing the electrons in a bit more detail um, and we no longer really picture them as whizzing around we picture them as uh, situation being situated in energy levels and the electrons around any atom or type of atom can only exist at certain energy levels and that's what pretty much got Bohr his, his um, Nobel Prize. Now the Bohr model, so he wanted to explain the spectra that you could see when you looked at what was called a hydrogen discharge tube and basically a hydrogen discharge tube is uh, something like a fluorescent tube just filled up with hydrogen um, without the phosphorus coatings and we'll talk about that a bit more and you'll actually, uh, you've actually seen um, or you'll get to see uh, hydrogen discharge tubes and how they work and what happens is if you uh, look at them with a spectroscope and a spectroscope is, is basically something that takes light in puts it through a prism is the simplest form and splits it into the wavelengths and so you can actually see uh, the rainbow of visible light spectrum and sometimes it uses a diffraction rating as well and what he saw was when he looked at this he saw five distinct lines in the spectrum or that was the spectrum for hydrogen and it couldn't be explained by Rutherford's model 
where the electrons were orbiting around the nucleus, sort of like um, the Sun orbit, the Earth orbits around the Sun, which was the planetary model. And so, just a quick history of, or, or this was the Thompson model, which was even earlier than Rutherford's model, and this had had the positive and negative charges mixed together. So, and that was that's uh, Rutherford. Just to show you some pictures of people. And Rutherford's model had a nucleus and the electron, and it was orbiting around. But uh, Bohr's model moved on from that. <coughs> and this is what you actually see when you point a spectroscope at a hydrogen discharge uh, tube. And so instead of seeing the whole rainbow of colours, it's black because you're not seeing those. They're not there. They don't exist. What you see instead are bright lines only at certain wavelengths for hydrogen. And that's what you see. A red line, blue lines, and some violet lines. And if you make any hydrogen uh, container and heat it up and excite the hydrogen atoms, you'll see those lines. So what did Bohr say? Well he said the electrons can move around the nucleus in certain allowed orbits. So they just can't whiz around. They're actually in controlled orbits. Now that contrasts with our whole idea that uh, electrons occur in zones of probability. Um, and so I was sort of like flies whizzing around your head. Because um, there's a whole different um, visualizations of what atoms are because we're trying to put human uh, visualizations onto things that aren't human and so when Bohr's looking at it he's looking at it in terms of the uh, energy levels and in energy levels there's only certain orbits that uh, that uh, the electrons can have and an electron has a different amount of energy in each orbit and the energy it has is in the form of kinetic energy movement but also potential energy from its position. And he proposed that the spectra was due to the movement of what's excited electrons in the hydrogen atoms falling back to their what's called the ground state. And the ground state is where the electrons are in the lowest possible energy uh, level. And an excited electron is an electron that gains energy through a variety of processes, has too much energy to be in that ground state and have to jump up <coughs> Excuse me. To higher energy levels, and then when they fall back to lower energy levels, they emit the excess energy, and that's what we're seeing as the spectrum. Now that's a bit confusing, but we'll go through it a few times. Now Bohr was able to mathematically predict the energy levels, and he was able to write the formula for it, um, and not only for hydrogen but for other elements as well. And the energy in the form of photons is emitted whenever the electron moves from a high energy level to a lower energy level. level. And the photon that's given off is corresponds to the energy difference between the two energy levels. And you have HF, so you get a certain frequency of photon depending on the transition that occurs. And that's why you only see certain lines on the spectra. For hydrogen, these levels are sometimes given in electron volts. Okay, so there's one, two, three, four, five of them. They could also be written in joules as well. <coughs> what does this look like? Well, here's here's a visualization of it. Again, this is not exactly what happens. It's, you you don't can't look at an, an atom and see shells like this, um, but it's a representation. So you have the nucleus, and this would be the ground state. So when the atom is, when in the case of hydrogen, it's only got one electron. So when it's in the lowest possible energy, the electron's down here. If the electron absorbs energy, it jumps up to a higher energy level. And because that's not stable, or it can be stable for a period of time, varies depending on the situation, um, but the electron basically wants to get back down here because there's now a gap in the energy levels um, where an electron could be. So the electron jumps back in and gives off that excess energy as a photon. So how can electrons be excited? Well, they can be excited by collisions, colliding with other particles, or by absorbing photons.
Now, when they gain energy by collisions, they can gain any amount of energy depending on the particle and the type of collision. And they can gain, if they're hitting another particle or interacting with another particle, they can gain all or some of their energy. However, if they're absorbing photons, they have to absorb all the energy of the photon. They can't absorb part of the energy of the photon. And again, we'll be looking at that in a bit more detail when we do some examples. Now, an electron jump is called a transition. I've already mentioned that. And the greater the energy change of the transition, the higher the frequency of the photon. Each possible transition gives a different spectral line. And so for hydrogen, you have these energy levels. These are our numbers in electron volts again. This is the ground state. So electrons can jump up to any of these levels. And if they get so much energy, they can actually, the atom can be ionized. The electron can escape. But then what happens is there's a gap. There's a hydrogen ion. And so electrons fall back in. So uh, in situations, hydrogens don't sit around without electrons for very long. So you have all these lines here now represent possible transitions. From up here, <coughs> excuse me, it can drop back. And it doesn't have to drop back into the ground state in, all, in one big jump. You can jump, it could jump here, and then from here to here, and then from here to here. So there's a whole lot. And each of these arrows would represent a line on the spectra if they correspond to producing photons of the frequency that is in the visible spectrum. Remember, some of these may actually be um, not in the visible spectrum. So here's a whole lot of words. Let's read it out for you quickly. Uh, emission and absorption spectrum. If light is radiated directly from its source, its spectrum is called an emission spectrum. Examples include the line spectrum above, which we've been talking about, and the continuous spectrum of the sun. And we'll be looking at the solar spectrum um, in class. The sun's emission spectrum is crossed by very faint dark lines. And here's an example down here. This is the solar spectrum. And depending on the resolution of your screen, you may see lots of uh, lines in it. And these lines are gaps. And these are absorption spectrum. They occur because some wavelengths emitted by the sun's core are absorbed by the gases in its outer layers. Some of the lines in the absorption spectrum of hydrogen are shown below, but we couldn't see them because they're hidden with all the others. When the sun's radiation passes through the gas, the atoms absorb photons whose energy match those in their emission spectrum. They then re-emit photons of these energies, but because they're emitting them in all directions, the intensity of uh, in the forward direction is reduced for these wavelengths. So though these are dark lines, they're not completely black. There are some photons coming through, but they're greatly diminished. Now that's a whole lot. Let's re-examine that and what do we mean by it in a bit more detail. So there's the solar spectrum with its lines of absorption. Um, now if we have uh, uh, discharge tubes for these elements, you can see that there's uh, emission lines. So basically what we've got is a, uh, some magnesium atoms and we're exciting them. There's nothing else there so these lines correspond to jumps in the energy levels of magnesium. And there's no other lines or photons being emitted because it's a emission spectrum. Now if we looked at the solar spectrum we might see that some of these dark lines correspond to these ones. So that would suggest that magnesium exists on the Sun. Hydrogen, we can see that hydrogen corresponds to these lines. There's a dark line there, that's hydrogen. Sodium, calcium and iron all exist in the solar spectrum. And so each, each element has its own characteristic uh, series of spectral lines because it has its own characteristic electron shells and has its own characteristic electron energy levels. So we're going to get the spectroscopes out in class and have a look at 
this and so that should hopefully help with your understanding a little bit more. Now the difference between an emission and absorption spectrum is shown in this slightly greeny diagram. If you just have a source of white light and you put it through a prism or a diffraction grating, you get a continuous visible spectrum. So you get all the wavelengths possible. If, however, it's a hot gas, which means that the electrons are getting excited, um, jumping up to higher levels and then jumping down, you get the emission lines that correspond to whatever gas it is. And you don't get any other spectral lines because it's not producing white lines, um, white light, it's only producing the photons from the energy transitions. If you shine white light through a gas, so you, you have this spectral going through this gas, some of these spectral lines will be absorbed, okay, according to, the, to what the gas is. And therefore you'll get an absorption spectrum, you'll get black lines where the gas has absorbed certain photons and then re-emitted them in all directions. <coughs> and so that's what an absorption line spectrum is. So emission line spectrum is bright lines on a dark background, and absorption spectrum is dark lines on the rainbow. Hopefully that made it a bit clearer. And another diagram, just showing it again, <coughs> um, in exactly the same way. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got the coughs this morning. Okay, so here's a whole lot of words saying exactly the same thing. So you should pause this and have a read of it, make sure you understand it. Here they call it line emission, but they introduce another term called band emission. This is similar to line emission spectrum, except the spectrum was due to excitement of gas molecules rather than atoms. And, that's, and you get fuzzy um, lines rather than... Um, sharp lines. So it's usually when you put a salt inside a flame or something and you look at the spectrum. Uh, that's a gas discharge tube. Uh, basically it's the evacuated little bit of gas of interest is put in there and then electrons are streamed at high voltage from one end to the other end and they have collisions and interactions with the atoms causing excitement and you get emission. So you get a line emission spectrum and from a white light you get a continuous spectrum all right now in the next video we'll look at how that related to the discovery of helium see ya